Hello everyone, I'm Phil Dickens and this is from the Hill of Megiddo, a podcast serialization of my book of the same name. In the last episode, we met all of our protagonists and we discovered that somebody called Nuada Wyandorn had been set free as a result of the destruction of town Megiddo. Meanwhile, another of Miles Darheen's friends had been murdered, right after the funeral of the last one. So let's dive into the next three chapters. Chapter 5 Jack parked up just behind the police car, already sitting in front of the house. The officers would be inside, questioning the victim's sister, something that would only add to her ordeal, and something that he and Hazel would need to put her through again. There wasn't anything at the crime scene for the police to go on, but he hadn't expected there would be. He found what he was expecting though, all the blood drained and marks indicating that the killer's teeth had been pointed. What he hadn't been expecting was how it had happened. Whoever had killed the man had called on him at home and led him away to his death. That was far from usual. Hazel reached into the pockets of her coat and pulled out her badge. Shall we? Put that away, Jack said. Don't get it out till it's needed, or you'll look over eager, alright? Just follow my lead. She shrugged and put it back into her coat. But yeah, let's. They got out and went to the door. A woman with dyed blonde brown hair answered. She had no makeup on and visible lines under her eyes, track marks for tears down her face. Oh, hello. Jack took out his badge, showed it to the woman and put it back in his jacket. Peripherally, he saw Hazel do the same. I'm sorry to bother you, Miss Morgan, but I'm Detective Inspector MacArthur and this is Detective Inspector Loman. She didn't look any less dubious. There's already police here? Yes, but if it's okay with you, we'd like to have a quick word with our colleagues and then take over where they left off. Uh, well, okay then, she gestured inside. Several streets over, an alley was cordoned off as police picked over it. A whole convoy of police vehicles, most with their lights still flashing, lined the curb. There was no sign of a body, suggesting that it had already been taken away. For that, at least, Miles was glad. He didn't want the sight of Paddy's corpse joining the image of Michelle's body propped up against the skip in his nightmares. There was a small crowd gathered to watch the proceedings from a distance, which they joined as they arrived. It might have been much bigger earlier, but with the body gone, they now made up about a third of the numbers. I took his cab, Lydia said with a sniff. They must have followed him. This would still have happened, Jess told her. If it hadn't been Paddy, it would have just been somebody else. They continued to stare for several more minutes. Nothing was happening, or at least nothing that they could actually see, but it was difficult to turn their attention away. Come on, Jess said finally. There's nothing else to see here. She turned and walked away. It was the first to follow her, and then the others all peeled themselves away from the spectacle. Miles was the last. His mind drifted back to the shadow propped against the skip, and the slow realisation that it was the dead body of somebody he knew. It was the same guy, he said. They were about halfway between the crime scene and Paddy's house. Everybody stopped and turned to look at him. You can't know that, Lydia said. Not for definite, but you must have thought the same thing. Silence. Miles took that to mean that they all had. They had to, because nothing else made sense. All right, Jess said eventually. Let's say you're right. Then what? When Miles didn't answer, she nodded in the direction that they had been headed. Come on, now's not the time for playing detective. As Hazel and Jack walked over to the car, Jack put a hand on her shoulder. It's hard, I know. My worst was interviewing a young Mormoose baby had been snatched and eaten in front of her. But no matter how much sympathy you have, the only way we can help them is by getting the things that did it. I've never been able to tell them or give them closure. She said. That's part of the job. This stuff can't be common knowledge. I know, I know. Out of the corner of her eye, Hazel saw a small group of people in their early twenties approaching them. Jack saw them too, but he stopped and muttered shit under his breath. One of the group, a redhead about Hazel's height but with a bigger frame, paid them more notice than just a passing glance. Jack? Lydia, what are you doing here? Jack asked. She looked around at her friends. We were just going to visit Claire to offer our condolences because... Are you here working? 
we are. We've just finished. Did you know the Vic Paddy? Lydia nodded. I'm sorry. We're uh, finished now, so if you want to go and visit. He took a step towards the car. Was it the same? This was the shorter of the two men, though he was still tall, with a thick chest and broad shoulders, as well as thick, long brown hair. Sorry, Jack said. The way he was killed, was it the same as with Michelle? Miles, another woman with muscular tattooed arms and blood red hair, hissed. Jack shook his head. I'm afraid that's not something I can disclose, he said before making his way around to the driver's door. I'll see you soon, Lydia. My condolences again. Hazel joined him in getting in the car. As the group headed to the door of the house, the woman who had chastised Miles punched him in the arm hard enough to make him wince. There might have been an argument, but then Lydia knocked on the door and they all went silent. Jack drove off, not waiting to see them go inside. What was that? Hazel asked him. Lydia's my sister-in-law. Avam took another one of their friends a few weeks back. That's rough. You think there's a connection? There might be. It would explain the uncharacteristic behaviour, if they're being targeted for some reason. We'll need to speak to them and do some digging. At least one of them is joining the dots as well. Yeah, we'll need to keep an eye on them. Amateur detective work will only put them in more danger. Puth was stripped to the waist, a sheen of sweat over his upper body, his muscles aching. He stopped for a moment, catching his breath. The heavy bag was still swinging in front of him. It had almost stopped when he stepped forward and resumed laying into it. He kept his feet moving, interspersing rapid jabs with crosses and the occasional hook. The sounds of his fist hitting the bag echoed around the walls of the empty gym. There was a stereo, and he could have had the music so loud that he wouldn't have been able to hear his own thoughts. But that wasn't what he wanted. His mind drifted. Nuwadu's face arose in his mind, skin bronzed by the sun, strong cheekbones, square jaw, grey eyes. And it changed, transformed into something else entirely, the thing that had been locked away until a couple of weeks ago. His fists flew faster, harder. He gritted his teeth and threw all of his weight behind it. The chain connecting the bag to the frame creaked and his muscles ached. He pushed through it, kept throwing the punches, feeling the sweat roll down the back of his neck and from under his arms. He stopped only when he physically couldn't throw another punch. Breathing hard, he doubled over and put his hands on his knees. There you are. He turned his head and saw Anaya standing at the door, an amused half-smile on her face. Has something happened? He asked. I was wondering the same thing. You've been gone for nearly three hours. Three? He raised his eyebrows. Huh. She frowned. I'm fine, Anna. I just needed to blow off some steam. So... Is there news? Right now. Noadu's still under the radar, and we're no closer to finding the champion. But I wanted to see how you were doing. We are still friends, aren't we? He looked down and let his shoulders sink. All of the fight gone out of him. We are. I'm sorry. Of course we are. It's just... He sighed. I've spent so long in hiding. We're giving up on it all. I even had a life of sorts. I mean, it pretty much just consisted of an income and a roof. But my standards were low enough that it was enough. And I laughed. I was a teacher. Still am, I suppose, if I ever go back. You've always been a teacher. But yeah, now he's back, it doesn't feel right to be sitting around, waiting. We're not just sitting around. I know that. He lashed out at the heavy bag. I also know that if we knew where he was, we aren't in a position to stop him right now. Still. Yeah. She walked over to him and went to put her hand on his shoulder. She stopped her hand an inch or so away before pulling it back while also wrinkling her nose. Right, how about you go and get a shower first? Then we can go out somewhere for some food? Just to do something other than brooding over our lack of progress? He smirked. Well, it is the best offer I've gotten in a long while. And it's the best you're going to get. When was the last time you did anything socially with another human being? I... No answer came to him, and a smear collapsed into a frown. She gestured to the showers. Go on. I'll meet you outside in 20 minutes. The clock in the corner of the screen said that it was five past one in the morning. Miles rubbed his eyes. His head was pounding. His eyelids felt heavy, 
and his legs were stiff from sitting in that position for so long. All for nothing, since so far he was no closer to knowing anything at all. Even the news reports which mentioned Michelle's and Paddy's murders had omitted the real cause of death. For Michelle, all it had said was that she may have been bitten, while for Paddy there wasn't even that. Neither had gotten more than a couple of paragraphs in the Liverpool Echo. Finding anything else was going to be an ordeal. Even searching for what had been done to Michelle, throat torn, blood drained, had just given him a mix of medical websites where you search for your own symptoms and the synopses for books about vampires. Vampires. He shook his head. What had possessed him to even entertain that idea? One of the pages open in his web browser now was about the real history of vampires. That at least covered mythology and said that if you actually drank blood on a regular basis you ran the risk of hemochromatosis. The one he had found earlier, claiming that while Dracula was a myth there were real vampires created by retroviruses which made them the next step in human evolution, had been beyond absurd. But then, all of this was beyond absurd. He closed the laptop and stood up. His legs were sore and stiff, so he paced. What was he doing? He wasn't a detective, or a monster hunter and staring at websites churned out by Google was hardly going to lead him to Michelle and Paddy's killer. He needed to get some sleep, but when he looked at his bed, he couldn't bring himself to go to it. His mind was too busy. His parents were asleep now, so he remained quiet as he left his room and headed downstairs and outside. The air was cool, not quite cold, and as it hit his face he felt more awake, reinvigorated. So now what? In lieu of alternative suggestions, he lit a cigarette and set off walking around the block. There was nobody about, of course. Houses were dark and silent, and the only creatures walking the streets besides him were the occasional cat off prowling for something to kill. No cars passed him until he turned out of his road and onto the main road. Even then, each one was at least 10 or 15 minutes apart. By the time he was on his third cigarette, he was several streets over from his house, but no closer to figuring out what he was doing. He passed a man in a bulky old army coat, with wild hair and an evil wilder look in his eye, walking a very energetic Staffordshire Bull Terrier. He found himself looking surreptitiously over his shoulder in case he was being followed. More for the man than for the dog, which had just looked happy to be out. But eventually the feeling passed and he stopped looking back. He returned to the image of Michelle's body, the shadow propped against the skip, then to the face of the man who had done it, and that pulse in his head when he had looked at him. The feeling that something about him was off, not quite right. Was it in his imagination? Should he have done something about it? What could he have done? Having been paying no heed to where he was, he didn't recognise his surroundings. The street he was on had a terrace on one side, all the lights out, and a field on the other. Several street lights were out along the road, making it all the darker. He took out his phone to see where he was. Shit. He was over five miles away from home. To what end? He could feel the fatigue seeping into his bones alongside the cold. No closer to any answers either. He shouldn't have come out here at all. Not being able to retrace his steps, since he hadn't been paying attention, he used the route planner on his phone to see his way home. Home. Michelle had been killed on a night out, so that could have been a coincidence. Paddy was led away from his home. The killer had knocked on his door. Even if they had followed him there, they must have known that he was at the funeral. Were they spying on all of them? How long had they been watching? A sliver of cold crept up the back of his neck and he became very aware of just how empty the street was. He glanced around but couldn't see anything. That was the point though. If they were being followed long enough that the killer knew where they lived, then he was very good at watching without being seen. Miles, on the other hand, had just blundered into the darkness without a thought and presented an easy target. Deep breaths. In and out, in and out. If he had been followed, there was nothing he could do about it, and if he looked like he suspected something, then if someone was watching, they would be more likely to go for him. He glanced at his phone, made sure that he was facing in the right direction, and started walking. Very quickly, it became a jog, then a sprint. He couldn't sustain it long, his lungs betraying him and making him drop back to a walk while hacking his guts up. His answer was to reach for another cigarette. Maybe he should quit, get fit, take up running. He would definitely do that. Tomorrow, if he got home in one piece. For now, as soon as he had finished that cigarette, he found that he needed another. Chapter 6 
Episodes of the cartoon Adventure Time were playing in the background and there was a stack of empty and half empty takeaway boxes in the middle of the floor. Everyone was sat slouched, either on the couch and chair or on the floor. Jess found herself staring into space, the bottle of beer in her hand three quarters empty and all but forgotten. Next to her, Kit's head was lolling as he drifted in and out of sleep. Isn't it though? She blinked and jerked her head around to look at Miles. Sorry, what was that kid? Uh, I was just saying, he shrugged. You know, I really think we need to talk seriously about trying to work out why we've been targeted by this guy and how we can find him to stop him. Jess sighed. She just wasn't awake enough for this, even if she had the patience. My, just stop, please. Yeah, but we're not vigilantes or detectives or any of that. At best, we find absolutely nothing and get ourselves worked up chasing the shadows. At worst, we'd only get ourselves killed. But Jess is right, my, Lydia said. I'd love nothing better than to have that bastard in a corner. Be able to... But yeah, it's not going to happen, is it? Let it go. Miles looked down, tapping his fist on the floor. Silence prevailed, and Jess found her attention drifting again. It was too much effort to move. Her centre of mass anchored to the couch, and there was a warm fuzziness about her head that made it difficult to think straight. Not that this was necessarily a bad thing. It meant that there was no tightness in her chest, no pulsing at her temples, no sensation of sinking into the ground, even when she was standing upright. Kit finally succumbed entirely to sleep. As he did, his body drifted sideways so that his arm pressed against hers, and his head landed on her shoulder. Her first instinct was to shrug him off, but she didn't. She glanced down at him, his lips twitching as he slept, and decided it was easier not to disturb him. She could feel the warmth from his body across her left side, but she didn't necessarily mind it. Shortly, the doorbell rang. Kit jerked awake and said, Chippy's here! Everyone laughed but it died away quickly enough. It was the early hours of the morning and they were expecting nobody. Who would be knocking? I'll go, Jess said. No, I will, Miles and Kit both said at once. Jess rolled her eyes. I'm harder than both of you, combined. Just be ready in case it kicks off. We should call the police, Lydia said. Not a bad idea, though Jess still headed to the door. Everybody was thinking the same thing. And if they were right about who it was, she wanted a piece of them. She sighed and opened the door, where her stomach tensed, and she forgot for several heartbeats to breathe. He looked older than she remembered from the end of that night in McKenna's. Not much older, but closer to 30 than 20, with more lines on his face. He was just wearing jeans and a plain hoodie now, but between the face and his jet black spiky hair, there was no denying that it was the man Michelle had left the club with. He smiled as easy and authentic as if he were reuniting with a long lost friend. He wasn't alone. The other man was a little shorter and a little broader, with a large head. He was bald and wore a scowl that said he was looking for a fight. Which, she supposed, he was. Can I help you? She kept her voice calm, even. That in itself was an achievement, since she would have loved nothing better right then to give them the fight they were looking for. We're looking for Miles? The one with the spiky hair said. They were after her brother. Why? I think you've got the wrong house, lads. I don't think so, Jess. Your brother's in there. You just want to see him. Her pulse quickened. She kept a straight face. So you know my name? Don't be rude then. Introduce yourselves. The one with the spiky hair laughed. You've got balls, girl. Fair play. I'm Gaz. This is Bry. Now can we see Miles or not? Why? Sod this, Bry said with a growl and stepped forward to shove Jess out the way. Jess caught his arm, twisted it and struck him in the face. He went sprawling and landed on his back. Gaz laughed, but he held his hands up and took several steps back as he advanced upon him. See, mate, this is why you don't charge him blind. He stopped moving and let Jess get a bit closer to him. Never tip your hand first. He grabbed Jess's arm and twisted locking it behind her back and pulling her close. Or it'll cost you. Oi! Mars' fist caught him in the jaw. The punch was hard enough to drop him. Before he could recover, Jess was putting the boot in. He doubled over and covered his head. Jess's boot caught him in the stomach. He wrapped his arms around her leg, then yanked. Mars caught her before she hit the floor. 
As Bry scrambled to his feet, Kit plunged into him, and the two of them ended up grappling. Then Bry grabbed Kit and flung him against the wall. Gaz was standing again. Jess recovered herself and went for him. As she raised her fist, his face changed. Jess cried out and he shoved her out of his way. Miles jumped in and earned a headbutt. He staggered and blood trickled out of his nose. The two killers both wore faces that were clearly not human. Grey and yellow skin, sunken cheeks, ridged brows and teeth ending in sharp points. Their eyes were red and on their hands their nails had extended to claws. Miles grabbed Kit and pulled him closer. Jess shuffled to his side in a kickboxing stance. So much for easy pickings, Brian muttered. What's the matter, shithead? Kit shouted. Lost your bottle? A police siren flared up not too far away. Lucky for you, darling. Gaz grinned and blew a kiss before grabbing his mate and fleeing. Then they were left standing outside in the cool air. Jess's heart was hammering and she was breathing hard. Her legs were trembling and she kept clenching and unclenching her fists. She wanted to hit somebody or something. What the fuck? What were they? Lydia said. Nobody had an answer. Gotta say, mate, that sounds completely fucking insane, Kit said. It was hours later and they hadn't long left St. Anne Street Police Station. They'd all given statements and were heading home to get some sleep. Miles took a deep breath and rubbed his hand across his face. Come on. His eyes felt like they were weighted down with mini sandbags. There was a steady thump, thump, thump in his temples and his stomach growled and quivered as though made from jelly. You saw Michelle. You know what happened to Paddy. They were all bitten and drained. And those guys' faces? Yeah. Kit looked as weary as Miles felt. The vampires, as mental as that sounds, I saw what you did. I'm a believer. I mean, us fighting them is insane. But... Jess put a hand on his shoulder. He's right, Mai. She said. Yesterday they were made up, as far as we knew. Today we're going to become vampire hunters. It is mad. No, but I mean... For a start, how do we even kill them? Dracula was stabbed with a knife. Most film and TV shows have them needing to be impaled on wooden stakes. Ancient legend says they have to be impaled, decapitated and buried with garlic in their mouths. And that's without going into other stuff like sunlight, fire, running water. He shrugged her hand off his shoulder. Okay, okay, I get it. He pulled his phone out of his pocket to see the time. Fuck, it's half seven. He looked back at his sister. But what are we supposed to do? I mean, come on. They were after us specifically. Michelle, then Paddy. They would have got the rest of us tonight if they could have. They're out for us for whatever reason. No. My, they weren't out for us. They were out for you. They knocked at the door and asked where you were. Yeah, but why? That's what we need to find out. No, we don't. Jess shook her head. We don't need to find out anything. We need to keep everybody safe. You especially. We can fight. Stop. My, please. Just stop. There was silence. All Miles could hear was the sound of their feet on the pavement and his own heart beat in his ears, thrumming in time with his migraine. Jess met Miles' eyes and reached out to squeeze his hand. He didn't squeeze back, but didn't shake her off either. I think we all just need to get some sleep, Lydia said. Breakfast first, Jess said. My hangover's already kicking in, I think. Mine too, Kit said. I could murder a fry up. Good shout. Lydia shook her head. Oh, Christ, no. You two enjoy that, but I'm going straight to bed before I pass out or vom. Or both. Your loss, Jess shrugged. My? Miles didn't answer. He was staring into the sky at nothing. He felt like a child, faced with something so terrible that all he could do was wish that it was a nightmare. Chapter 7 Despite how bright it was outside, the warehouse was almost completely dark. Gaz's footfalls echoed across the open space as he paced back and forth at the far end of the room. Close by, on a battered old couch, Bry was slouching and tossing crisps into his mouth as if they had nothing at all to worry about. Fuck him, lad, he said. 
If he was that arsed, he'd have been there himself. They wouldn't have been able to blindside us. Gaz didn't stop pacing. Most of the other occupants of the factory were in the back room, sleeping, or across the other side of the main floor with the poker game, using one of the old wooden crates as a table. He caught one or other of them looking at him every now and then, but chose to ignore it. We knew we were outnumbered, so he should have at least sent more than two of us. Except even against more of them, we still should have... Well, we didn't. Rice scrunched up the empty crisp packet and threw it. It landed nowhere near the bin by the wall. It's shit, but we learned from it. That means thrift off as well. The door at the far end of the warehouse creaked open, then slammed against the wall. Christoph marched in with purpose in his stride. The tail of his trench coat stared up the thick layer of dust and debris on the floor. Christoph was tall, broad-shouldered and square-jawed. He stopped in front of Gaz, close enough to make him take a step back. Gaz looked over at Bry, who huffed and jumped up from the couch. He slapped Gaz on the back and stood next to him. You failed, Christoph said in a low, heavy Eastern European accent. Gaz swallowed. Christoph was too close, his stare unwavering and boring into his skull. We know where it is, he said, managing despite everything to keep his voice even. We located the champion. Yes, and you let him and his friends best you. That wasn't... Christoph held up a hand. Enough! He turned and bellowed. Everybody, assemble now! His voice was loud enough that Gaz jumped. He steadied himself but nobody was looking at him. Christoph had moved into the centre of the room and was stood waiting. The card game broke up and the players wandered over, while others shuffled out the back room of the factory. Gaz counted about 70, men and women, in a semicircle around Christoph. Their numbers were growing. Good, Christoph said. You can return to your slumber soon enough, but first we need to discuss the consequences of Gaz and Bry's failure. Our names sound funny in your accent. Rye said. Gaz hit him in the shoulder hard enough that he winced. Christoph's tone did not change, nor his voice rise, but his eyes burned into Bry. I've torn men's heart out for such insubordination. Your only saving grace is that you still have some use to me. Do not make me revise that assessment. So, uh, Gaz put a hand on Bry's chest and nudged him away from Christoph. What's the plan? As we discovered last night, if we're to attack them head-on again, we'll need to outnumber them. Yes, this is doubly true since the champion and his friends may have come to the attention of the guild, meaning that we may need to show our hand sooner than intended. Late in the afternoon, Jack pushed open the door to the staff room in McKenna's and caught his sister-in-law's eye. Lydia beckoned him in. She was sat around a table with Jess and Kit. Miles was leaning against the wall. You can sit. Jack said. I prefer to lean. He shrugged, but didn't argue. Okay, fine. What's up then, Jack? You said it was about what happened the other night? Lydia asked. There was no way to ease them into this gently, so Jack decided to lay his cards on the table. Yeah. When you were attacked by vampires? Several moments of silence passed. Vampires? So we're not imagining this? Kit said, confirming Jack's suspicion that they had already worked out what was going on. Or well, we are, but Jack is too, Lydia offered. You saw the faces, Jack said. What they did to your friends? You didn't see their faces, Lydia said. How do you know about this? Did the police regularly hunt vampires? He sighed. I'm not actually with the police. What? A pause. Does Abby know? Jack hesitated. That's a yeah then. Lydia, she is my wife. And my sister. Come on then, I'm the last to know. Don't keep me in suspense. Right. He sighed. Well... I work for something called the Cycladic Guild of Warlocks. Hold on, Jess said. You're a warlock? No, I'm not from the Cyclades either. The original guild was a group of seven extremely powerful sorcerers who in around 3300 BC defeated the great evil that was threatening civilization. 
the descendants still control the organization though now it's a global body that keep, deals with keeping the supernatural in check and the raps there were several beats of silence and you work for them lydia asked i'm the head of the guild outfit in liverpool he glanced around at all of them one of the things we do is contact those who've had a direct experience of the supernatural either to recruit them if they're worth recruiting or to help them readjust to a normal life do we get to choose which lydia asked of course it's up to you but we would like you on board the group exchanged looks all clearly unsure of themselves in that moment this was a relief to jack because even though he was there to recruit them he didn't want them to simply dive in without thinking this is all real then jess said not only do vampires exist but there's a secret order of vampire hunters run by magicians we would have had some clue before now surely would we kit asked well yeah i mean the government can't keep mundane secrets for fuck's sake this isn't the government though lydia looked at jack is this a government thing he shook his head somewhere along the line the right people know enough that we can go out about our business without any issues but that's it intricate conspiracies fall apart so we keep our own secrets also you should know that the guild aren't vampire hunters at least not primarily vampires haven't been particularly numerous or prolific for many centuries as a rule they don't hunt as much as law in their prey social outcasts runaways and so on occasionally the homeless the other reason we wanted to speak to you is because we believe that you're being hunted out specifically as one everyone looked at miles jack raised his eyebrows they said they were after miles jess told him i guess that this isn't the place to discuss it but i can pick you up tomorrow and bring you to our office for a visit if we say yes you mean lydia said chick this was jess we have to find out what's happening i know lydia said with a sigh i'm not overly keen on it though fair enough but if there's an actual organization dedicated to this, to this stuff and it's not just us going off hard cocked it might be worth a shot everyone else was silent they all had a tough choice to make and one that jack couldn't make for them vampires lydia exhaled slowly and shook her head i mean fuck we already knew that it said well we guessed as much yeah but to have it confirmed like that the sun was just setting and the air was still humid the group was stood outside mckenna's to one side of the doorway as people made their way in and downstairs miles found himself staring off into the distance though not at anything in particular were they out there now were they watching lying in wait ready to attack it was probably best to try and not think about it but that wasn't exactly easy we should stick together he said this prompted everyone to give him funny looks i just mean the last thing we want is another chance for them to pick us off one by one there were members of agreement i'm all for that jess said they know where i live and it's a safe bet they can find the rest of us easily as well i'll give everyone a lift to pick stuff up and then we should probably all go to the same place i reckon lydia's would probably be the best bet to hold up in tonight yeah plus it'll save me having to disturb the baby lydia stepped closer to miles and nudged him in the arm do you want to come with help me get the place set up for visitors miles tensed up and his heart quickened seeing jess and kit share a knowing smirk didn't help not trusting himself to form words he nodded he could feel the heat in his face and the tension in his chest and the fact that kit waved at him as he left with jess only heightened what he was feeling we could probably get away with walking you know lydia said leading leading him away from mckenna's in the direction of her house the silence between them as they walked stretched out he ought to say something to break it but what he didn't want to sound stupid or start babbling but wasn't the ongoing silence worse than that he opened his mouth to speak are you okay lydia asked she reached out and squeezed his shoulder miles smiled then forced it into a frown so he didn't look like an idiot he shrugged 
Uh, I guess so. I wouldn't blame you if you weren't. This whole thing's far too weird for my liking. She took out a pack of cigarettes, lit two up, and handed him one. Yeah, I owe you. Well, a few, actually. But yeah, if I were you, I'd be breaking it right now. Having them hunting me out specifically. I can't imagine what you must be going through. Well, I hadn't really thought about it. He nudged her with his elbow. Till now, anyway. Oh, sorry. He grinned. I'm joking. Don't worry about it. I know. You were right, though. You were the first one to see that we were being targeted. And to suggest that we do something about it. We should have listened. I doubt it would have changed much. We didn't know what we were up against. No, I guess. Still, at the very least we can start listening now. You're not as soft as you look. Maybe I should be the leader then? Let's not get too carried away, chick. They both laughed. Shortly, they arrived at Lydia's house. It was full dark now. They were far away enough from the blare and bustle of the city centre that it was quite calm. There were only a couple of other people outside, and very little traffic. As they reached the door, Miles felt his heart rate speed up. Why? He cursed his stupid nerves and tried to ignore the somersaults his stomach was doing. Several moments after they stepped into the house, a woman a couple of years older than Lydia came out of the living room to greet them. She gave Miles a look which he couldn't quite decipher, but only for a moment. Go home early, she said to Lydia. I told you I wouldn't be out long, Cass. Hmm. Another look at Miles. Well, Sadie's well away anyway, so you should be undisturbed for the rest of the night. Lydia rolled her eyes, then she thanked the woman and they said their goodbyes. I thought you'd met my cousin Cassie before? She asked Miles once they were alone. If I have, I think I made a bad impression. She laughed. That wasn't about you. She's very Christian and worried about my life of sin. I'm sure she's convinced I'm bringing boys like you home for nights at debauchery all the time. Probably with Satan worshipping thrown in for good measure. So she's jealous? Lydia laughed again. Then she caressed Miles' hand and he became very aware of how close they were standing. Just a few inches apart. Their eyes were locked and it would take only the smallest movement to put his lips to hers. He realised that he was holding his breath and forced himself to let it out. Slowly, so as not to make it obvious. Don't get near as much debauchery as I'd like, to be honest. No, me either. He winced. Did he just say that? Idiot. But Lydia smiled, chewing on her lip. Then she leaned up on her tiptoes and kissed him. Gently at first, her lips pressing soft and wet against his. Then more forcefully, she put her arms around his neck and he found himself holding her waist. Her lips parted and their tongues touched, only fleetingly. She used her teeth to pull gently on his bottom lip, eliciting a moan. Any nervousness or trepidation he had felt was gone. As their waists pressed together, he became aware of how hard he was. She made a small noise when she felt it, and then let one hand move down and wander over the front of his jeans. The touch sent an electric rush through him, and he pressed their bodies closer together. He put a hand up her top, caressing the soft skin on her back, and drawing out a groan. From upstairs, there came a bump and then crying. So much for being undisturbed for the night, Lydia said. She headed upstairs, but stopped halfway when she saw that Miles was still standing in the hall. Come on, don't just stand there like a wally. Come and give us a hand. Lydia's daughter, Sarah, had fallen out of bed and was sitting on the floor crying. She had the same shape to her face as her mother, as well as the same thick, open hair. Her cries faded down to whimpers when she saw Lydia but after a moment rose again to a crescendo. Lydia picked her up. Come on now, Saz, she said gently. What's the matter? Did you hit your head? The little girl shook her head. And what's the matter? Why are you crying? She swallowed down her tears and then, after a moment's hesitation, said, Bad men, bad men hurt mummy. Nobody's hurting mummy, sweetie. I'm fine. You had a bad dream. Sarah shook her head again. Bad men. Bad men with yellow faces and big teeth. Miles' stomach tensed. He looked over at Lydia and saw that she had paled. Her hands were shaking, and Sarah was sinking lower in her arms. He moved over and took the girl in his own arms and put her back down on the floor. Sit down, he told Lydia, 
and she dropped compliantly onto the bed. Then he knelt so that it was at her daughter's eye level. It was only a dream, you know. They can seem real, but they're not. They can't hurt you. Sarah crossed her arms and scowled. They can. Bad men. Miles thought for a moment, then smiled. You're right. They are bad men. But you want to know a secret? She nodded. They can only hurt you if you're scared of them. That's their power. If you're brave and you refuse to be scared, they can't do anything. So you have to be brave. And that'll help your mummy be brave too, so they can't hurt her either. Can you do that? Sarah chewed her lip, insinuating how much she looked like Lydia. After a moment, she nodded vigorously. Good. Now how about a high five? He put his hand up and the little girl slapped it, then giggled. You think you'll be okay to go back to sleep now? Once Sarah had been tucked back into bed, with several extra teddies around her, Miles followed Lydia into her bedroom. She was still pale and looked shaken, but she was also smiling as she sat on the edge of the bed with him. That was amazing. She squeezed his hand. You're so good with her. He shrugged. Same mental level. She shoved him. Come on, it's more than that. I'm impressed. They kissed again, though not quite as passionately as earlier. Everyone else will probably be here soon. My daughter's followed my cunning plan to get you alone and take advantage of you. You mean we won't even have time for a quick satanic ritual? Lydia's eyes lit up as she looked at him and her mouth curled into a grin. Well. But then there was a knock on the door. No. No, there's really not. But far from being disappointed, Miles found that it was hard to stop smiling. The sun was just coming up by the time most of them had managed to drift off. Miles was still wide awake, however. He felt tired. His pulse was pounding in his head, and there was a weight in his arms and legs that he felt was dragging him down. Yet still, there wasn't even the threat of sleep. He was running out of cigarettes, though, and decided that a walk around to the shops would clear his head. He didn't move straight away. Lydia was lying next to him, now asleep and snoring softly, and that was part of the reason he couldn't switch his mind off. It was the dire threat to their lives as well, of course, but at that moment it was secondary. What if this was only a one-off? A way of coping with the danger they were in. If it wasn't, how would he know when he was coming on too strong or not strong enough? What happened next? A whole night of going around in circles in his mind hadn't given him a single answer. It also didn't stop him needing a smoke. He forced himself out of bed and as quietly as he could, headed downstairs and outside. There, he was greeted by an extremely fluffy back cat, which glared at him before running away. The shops were only around the corner, so he was there in a couple of minutes. Most were closed, but a small news agent had not long opened. Just before he reached the shop, there was a growl behind him. He felt his whole body tense up. He turned, but before he could cry out, a blow to his chest knocked the wind out of him and sent him crashing to the floor. Then there was a hand pinning his head down and teeth at his neck. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this and you want more, then you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, AK Black and Red, or search for From the Hill of Megiddo on your favourite podcast service. Next week, we'll be going into the chapters 8 through 10 to see what happens now that the vampires have gotten their target. See you then.